Once upon a time, we had a great ambition. We would, we thought, create the best podcast the internet had ever heard. And to do so, we would take as our example all the best sorts of things we really liked when it came to entertainment. Which, for us, has always been discovering something new, unique, and surprising. And one of the shows we really, really liked was a science program that took all the developments of science, history, and technology and connected them in new, unique, and surprising ways. You could see how one change over here affected all the things between it and the new things way over there. It was exactly the sort of show we enjoyed most. If you're a regular listener of this show, you might know all this already. But that show was called Connections, and it was hosted by science historian James Burke, who had not only flared collars and cuffs, but a flair for making the seemingly mundane much more interesting than it had any right to be. The 10-episode series was produced in 1978 for the BBC, and the next year came to American television, though that's not where either of us first found it. We caught it in reruns on the Discovery Channel some 20 years later. Burke's premise for the whole series was that no one person or event in the chain of ideas and developments that led from one thing to another had any idea about what their discoveries would mean once they had discovered them, nor how they would be used, nor what would come from them once they were put into use. They couldn't. That would be seeing the future. Unfortunately, the way science and history were taught at the time, and in some cases are still taught, was that whatever thing we had now was the inevitable result of a clearly thought out chain of events and intent. We had TV because we were always going to have TV from the moment the first caveman picked up two rocks and bashed them together. There was just no way not to have TV because of the rock banging. Instead, according to Burke, each person did what they did not because of some grand inevitable design, but because they were each motivated by their own personal ambitions and desires, sometimes altruistic, sometimes not. Some folks worked on things because they were greedy, some folks because a thing piqued their interest, some because they were paid to do it, and others discovered and developed things simply by fortuitous accident. It was the cumulative effect of all these independent operators going about their business for their own reasons that got us where we are today. Or at least where we were in 1978. It was only by looking backwards along the chain that developments seemed inevitable. When it was actually happening, you simply had no idea how it would all turn out. Each episode of the show would contain a looping trail of discovery and development that would start at one place say, the standardization of precious metals by use of a touchstone, and travel along the line of innovation from that genesis to increased trade from Greece to Persia, the development of massive commercial trade centers along the routes used, and the building of the Library of Alexandria. The library held Ptolemy's observations of the stars and their movement, which was used by navigators during the Age of Discovery 14 centuries later, when improvements in ship sails and rudders made it actually possible to discover the things they would discover. This led to mariners realizing compass needles didn't actually point to true north, which led to investigating magnetism, which led to discovering electricity thanks to the use of a sulfur ball by German scientist, inventor, and politician von Gurich. That led to interest in atmospheric electricity, which, at the Ben Nevis weather station, led to Charles Wilson developing the first cloud chamber, which allowed for the observation of passing ionizing radiation, from which important things were learned by Sir Watson Watt so he could develop radar, and by Ernest Rutherford so he could develop nuclear weaponry and change the world once more. And that's just one episode. The first series did 10 episodes of that sort of thing, and then when you got to the end of episode 10, you discovered the whole series loops back on itself to where it all began in episode one. The series was successful enough that it spawned several sequels through the years, as well as a computer game. And it inspired us to start the show you are listening to now. And sure, we've changed a fair bit from the original premise, and it's unlikely we'll be picked up on either side of the pond for a television run, 
but we like to think we've done pretty okay and remained at least a little true to our original inspiration. The only fault, of course, being that James Burke never had to do a Lost episode. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. You'll have heard the phrase, they've got their head in the clouds. Maybe you've even seen a show or read a book that has the sort of character that just isn't attached in any measurable way to reality. Usually, you can identify them by their whimsical outlook, cheery disposition, and adamant refusal to see the bad side of, well, anything, really. They look danger in the face and give it a little peck on the cheek, a pat on the head, and tell it everything will be okay if they just keep smiling and look on the bright side. And frankly, it's all a bit suspicious how well things work out for them in spite of what appears to be their pig ignorance of how things usually go. You might almost think they know something you don't. And often, they do. Discworld, our perennial favorite example of things around here, has the bursar at Unseen University. He isn't just clinically insane. He's being actively driven twice around the block of mad by the Arch-Chancellor and has no grip whatsoever on any rung of the reality ladder. And yet he's a whiz, pardon the pun, at mathematics and is frequently, in those novels which he appears, the one who gives the key that unlocks the plot which the other characters will then go on to resolve. Fortunately, he has dried frog pills and is now capable of hallucinating that he is sane. Into the same category, you can check characters like Phoebe from Friends, Rose Nyland from The Golden Girls, and every appearance of Harpo Marx ever. Strangely disconnected characters operating under their own rules without regard for how things usually work towards a goal no one really understands and usually succeeding, often to the benefit of not only themselves, but to everyone around them even show up at the game table, either as GM non-player characters or as the characters themselves. They're just fun to watch in action and even more fun to play. Because they are so generally loony, you can get away with a lot more than a character played straight. But the question is, where did this sort of character and the associated phrase, head in the clouds, come from? Well, if you've seen the Lego movie, and we think by now most people have, you've already got your big clue. In the movie's second act, the characters go to a place that, if you didn't know any better, you'd think was made entirely out of cotton candy and frosted cupcakes. It's a place that makes no sense and appears to be inhabited by people made from randomly connected Lego bricks. Here, Emmett and the gang meet Unikitty, advance the plot a bit, and get ready for the third act. It's called Cloud Cuckoo Land. Aristophanes was a playwright who lived in Greece between 446 BCE and 386 BCE. Note that this is just a few years after the Greeks have essentially defeated the Persians, as explained in our episode on Xerxes. To be strictly accurate, he was a comedic playwright. That is, he wrote plays that were comedies, not that he was particularly funny himself, though we suppose he must have been to some extent. And because 11 of his 40 or so comedic plays have survived to the modern day, he is sometimes referred to as the father of comedy. According to those who know these sorts of things, Aristophanes' depictions of everyday life in his hometown of Athens were the most accurate and most convincing of any playwrights available, and his ability to poke fun at and ridicule public figures was to be feared. Plato even pointed out one of Aristophanes' plays as the slander that contributed to the eventual death of Socrates. Mostly what Aristophanes did, though, was write plays to win competitions. This was big entertainment Athens style. Every year a number of contests were held to see who could write the best, most entertaining, and most comedic plays, with the winner being treated almost as if he were a big-name athlete in the modern day. Win a writing competition, and everyone knew your name. My, how times have changed. Try putting that on your reality TV. In 414 BCE, a competition was held in connection with the Dionysia, an annual celebration to the god Bacchus. 
Aristophanes submitted a play that survives to this day called The Birds. It only came in second, but he can take some consolation in knowing that no one has heard of the first place play in centuries. Their singing and dancing and swearing and extravagant costuming, and according to some scholars, for once it wasn't a play that was banging on about current events in Athens with a heavy hand. Unlike some of his other works. It's really hard to see how anything else could compare, but there you go, second place. Two older Athenian men are wandering out in the wilderness outside of town. For reasons which shall be revealed momentarily, one of them has a crow on his shoulder and the other a jackdaw. Between the two, they've gotten it into their heads that everything about Athens, and perhaps all of Greece, is all washed up. The people don't do anything but argue about the law all day long. They are litigious, sycophantic, and conniving, and Pistaterus and his friend Euelpides have had enough of it. As far as the two of them are concerned, it's time to seek better fortunes elsewhere. They both heard the rumor that a former prince of Athens, Turius, was made to quit the city and take up exile, but that, as fortune would have it, he was metamorphosed into a bird and became Epops, the hoopoe, king of the birds. A hoopoe, incidentally, is a very colorful bird with a flamboyant crest on its head like a crown. There's other stuff about Turius being an adulterer and whatnot, but that doesn't enter into this particular play. Aristophanes just needed someone well-known and formerly royal that everyone had heard of. Logically, of course, if Epop is the king of the birds, then all birds should know how to find him, and so a few minutes in the Athenian market and a few coins later, Pistaterus and Euelpides set out with their newly acquired birds. By listening to their various squawks and caws, they've carefully followed what they believe to be directions to find Epop and ended up in a desolate spot in the middle of nowhere. Which looks very much like all the other desolate spots in the wilderness they've been led to over the last hundred miles or so. It's about now that the two begin to realize that A, the merchant who sold them the birds took them for fools, B, the birds don't have a clue where Epop or any other hoopo is, and C, they're tired and worn out and really just want to go home. Still, a life among the birds does appeal as a life of leisure and pleasure, so onward they go. Which is, of course, the moment in the story when they find the king. After dealing with his secretary and gopher, the wren, Epop appears at the door to a bower, demanding to know what they mean by disturbing him. They begin by describing the sort of place they would like to live, seeking a city that meets with their particular desires. Say, one that hasn't got tax collectors, and isn't likely to see the Athenian fleet show up looking for them, which seems to be the main concern. Surely Epip must know of one, since he has both the intelligence of a man and a bird now, and is able to fly where he likes to see how things are. Rejecting all the suggestions Epop makes for one reason or another, they then ask about the city of the birds and what it must be like. Much to their surprise, the birds do not have a city to call their own. Well, what could be more natural than building one that they all, man and bird, could inhabit together, says Piss the Terrace. And of course, why not build a city for the birds up in the sky between men and the gods? In this way, Humans could worship the birds as they rightfully should, given all their advantages, and the gods would be forced to acknowledge the supremacy of birds because the new city would prevent the smoke of all the sacrifices to the gods from actually reaching them, thus starving them out if they do not capitulate. And crazily enough, this is exactly what they do. And it works. And by the end of the whole thing, Euelpides has been written out of the play, all the people who come to the bird city either get a pair of wings of their own, or, if they prove to be the annoying sort of person who wants to bring the troubles of Athens with them, a beating. And Piss the Terrace is crowned king of not only the birds, but men and the gods as well. But what to call this new city? Sparta? No, it's been done. Why not Nephilococagia? Cloud Cuckoo Land. And so, Cloud Cuckoo Land becomes over the years a catch-all name for any sort of crazy utopia, where nothing ever goes wrong, everyone is happy, and all your days are filled with pleasure of one sort or another. 
In other words, it's a place with no basis in reality and whose residents are mostly just lucky fools who happen to succeed when really they shouldn't have. And the people who live there or act as if they do are called cloud cuckoo lenders, which is the term used to refer to the sorts of characters like Unikitty, Rose Nyland, Phoebe, and the bursar at Unseen University. Also, it's a pretty funny play even by modern standards, and you should read it, though we can't recommend the ebook version. Get paper. The Birds is exactly the sort of adventure a disgruntled old man would imagine himself capable of having just by using his wits and a bit of fast talking. This next bit is also about some writing, but it also represents the sort of weird confluence of events and research that we get around here. The exact sort of serendipitous event that James Burke would make so much from on his connection show. The kind of thing that lets you branch out in all sorts of directions without even really trying. A few months ago, we were once again looking for ideas around which to plan a show, and we happened to ask at the dinner table one night for ideas from the peanut gallery. Now, as you may know, our number one fan is a strong supporter of the show and also happens to be the world's most to-hand audience member ever. It's no effort whatsoever to get feedback from her. But on that occasion, she came up dry. Nothing occurred to her to suggest. Enter fan number 10,001, the fan about whom we do not speak. Not because he's secretly Voldemort with an anagram, but because he only rarely listens. To the show, we mean. Believe me, we were just as surprised as you when he spoke up, and he only had one word to say. We're bats. No, we don't know what prompted it either, but there it was. We're bats. No idea. We wrote it down and then slowly backed away from the table. Well, Weirbats are in Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, when you get to looking, they're in a lot of places, though we don't ever recall ever personally running across them in any of our games. We suppose, though, that the reason they're so much everywhere is that because once something gets into D&D, it's only a matter of time before they crop up in everything that takes some inspiration from D&D. Fair enough. Look for them in Final Fantasy, Elder Scrolls, Castlevania, and more. They've been in D&D since the first edition, though that's about as interesting as their origin story gets in terms of their inspiration. Someone knew about Weirbats and wrote them into the game. They aren't vampires, just man-bats that prefer to drink blood. Well, not man-bats really, more like goblin-bats or drow-bats. Come on, they're from the Underdark. You've got to work with what you've got. Normally, a weirbat looks like a halfway stage in a lengthy stop-motion transformation sequence, but they are also capable of sprouting the wings and the more defined facial features of a full-on bat, at which point they're really giant bats, more or less. All pretty standard stuff for a weird creature in D&D. Probably their most famous appearance, if they can be said to have one, was in Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage. And that, we thought, was that. Not much more to go on there. And then, and then we came across the word Camazots. White Wolf has a whole thing about the Camazots, which are, or were, we're bats in their Werewolf the Apocalypse game. They're some sort of shirt tail cousins of all the other lycanthropes, and here we of course mean Therianthropes, but we're well behind in that fight. A lost faction of Fera, long ago destroyed. In South America. And that set off a little bell. We'd seen Camazots before. Not because we'd played White Wolf games, no, but because we had recently been doing research for our Trickster episodes. You know, the ones with Raven, Coyote, and Rabbit from back in January. As part of that research, we had come across some mention of the various gods of Mesoamerica, particularly those of the Maya, and particularly those from an oral tradition which had been written down and recorded in the 1500s in a book called Popol Vu, which meant Book of the Community. Later, it was transcribed by the Spanish Dominican friar Francisco Jimenez in the 18th century. The Popol Vu is the mythology and history of the Kiichi people from various parts of what is now Guatemala, Mexico, and Belize. The traditions it records date back to well before the Spanish came to South America, 
They cover the Mayan creation myth, and in particular the adventures of the hero twins, Hunapu and Zbalanke. The twins are the sons of one of an earlier pair of twins, Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu. And yes, we know we're butchering these names, but we're doing the best we can. See Sahuajin. Hun and Vukub get themselves invited down to the underworld because they are apparently such amazing ball players. There, they play a game against the lords of the underworld, but of course, the lords cheat and put them through trials and try to trick them, and eventually, the twins lose and are killed. Well, when Hun dies, the twins Hunapu and Zbalanke are magically conceived and born. Eventually, they too come to the underworld and seek revenge for the death of their father. They succeed, and as a reward, we suppose, they become the sun and the moon. These, then, are the hero twins. Well, as part of their revenge-seeking adventure, they too get put through trials and tricks, and one of their trials is to spend the night in the House of Bats. As you might expect, the House of Bats is full of bats. Not the kind you play ball with, but the kind that flap around squeaking and trying to kill you, apparently. The real problem is not the bats themselves, though. Rather, it is the presence of the Mayan bat god, Camazots, which means Handily enough, Death Bat. You can see how that might be a problem. It sounds unfriendly from the start. It's not helped by the fact that in Mesoamerican culture, the bat is associated with night, death, and sacrifice. Well, of course, it all comes to a head, both literally and figuratively, in the House of Bats. In order to defend themselves from the hordes of bats circling and flapping and squeaking and doing other batty things, the hero twins squeeze themselves deep deep into their own blowguns. Hiding. Hey, they're heroes. They can do that sort of thing. Unfortunately, the problem with hiding in a blowgun is that you've got virtually no view at all of what is going on outside the blowgun. The twins only had to stay the night, but inside a blowgun, everything is dark. How do you tell when the night is over? Well, if you're Dingus Hunapu, you just stick your head right out the end of the blowgun and take a look around. At which point... Death Bat God Camazot swoops down and snatches your head right off your shoulders, flies it to the ball court, and hangs it up, ready to be used as a ball in the next game. Eventually, the sun does rise, the bats all go back to the roost, and Spalanke climbs out of the blowgun to see what can be done about his brother. As for how that turns out, well, modern editions of Pulple View are available. We're reasonably certain that's where D&D Weirbats came from. So really, there you go. Trickster gods, to the Mayans, to Popol View, to Camazots, to White Wolf, to Weirbats, to D&D. A nexus of connections just waiting to be used. Sometimes Fan 10001 is kinda handy. Thank you once again for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We look forward to serving you again. We've got some vacation time coming up next month, so expect June to be one episode lighter than it should be. Even so, we'll be hard at work thinking of new topics to tackle, just for you. If you enjoy the show, even these weird little lost episodes, why not head over to our support page at gmwordoftheweek.com and check out all the ways you can support the show. Our number one fan was very impressed with the selection of items available at our Redbubble merch store and the designs thereon. We also hear through one of our other fans that the long t-shirts are so amusingly printed that they make excellent nightwear. Go figure. Head on over and check it out for yourselves and explore the other options available to you as well if merchandise isn't your thing. Though the backpacks and duffel bags have been confirmed cool by yours truly. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who seriously had never come across a weird bat before and was surprised to learn it wasn't just a stray vampire bat. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Oh, we know. Wrinkle in Time. One of its planets. And we know the thing you're going to tell us about Banjo-Kazooie, too.